Hey, uh, good morning to you. It's good to be with you. And uh, we are in these weeks of June and July uh, walking through a message series entitled More Than a Member. And uh, we are challenging uh, our church family here at St. John's to consider going beyond uh, just membership. Uh, not membership, though we use that term around here to talk about you know, church family and who's connected and its names on the rolls. And no, Okay, fine. The term is helpful, uh, but it also can be hurtful if we stop there. Uh, We're not talking religion over these weeks and religious activities because many of you, you're like me, you've tried that and come to the place in your life where religious activity is one thing, but there's something more in the movement of God uh, in our community that that God seems to be up to. Uh, We're not talking about institutional church either uh, because that is uh, not... You can't find that in the Scriptures anywhere. Uh, When the Scriptures speak of the church, it's always the people of God, in movement together, on mission together, with the kingdom of God breaking in through our hands and in our feet. And so the question we're kind of asking you to consider over these weeks and actually into the future that God has in store for us is more than a member, uh, to go beyond a member mentality, because what if more and more of us as God's people went beyond the concept of membership to something bigger. What could God do uh, with His people, the church, our family, as we consider more than membership? And uh, some of you over these weeks, uh, you're hearing that, and something inside of you is going, I've always known that. I'm in for that. For me, it's not about just having my name on a page. It's not about religion or institutional church stuff. Uh, I'm in, and I'm, I'm in for what God is doing here. Great. Some of you over these weeks, there's something inside of you that is going, I've not heard that before. I've understood church to be religion and institution and membership and religious. I understood it to be that way, and I'm, I'm intrigued with this. And the reason you're intrigued with that is not because Sam's a good preacher, you know better. Uh, Not because I'm a good preacher, you know better. Uh, That's actually the Holy Spirit inside of you uh, moving, and God is more and more trying to get your attention to go beyond membership, to go beyond institutional church stuff. He, He wants you to join the mission that is the mission of Jesus in our community to redeem and restore what's broken. Uh, That's God in your gut trying to get your attention. Uh, Some of you over these weeks, you're going to hear that and go, I have no idea what he is talking about. I'm actually okay with membership. I'm okay with religious activities. I'm okay with institutional church. Uh, That's good with me. And uh, the problem, uh, if that's you, and if if that is you over these weeks, here's the good news. Uh, You are saved. Your place in heaven is secure. You are loved by God, and you are good to go. Uh, But the problem for you over time will be if you have a membership mentality, at some point that is not going to be good enough for you. Uh, At some point, you're going to come to the place where several outside of the church and in the community have come to when it it comes to religion and institutional church stuff. There's got to be something more. Because if it's just membership, if it's just names on a page, if it's just the church's institution, people's lives don't really get changed. And God is in the changing lives business, and, uh, and He's doing that in and among us here. And so we've challenged you over uh, the past few weeks to consider formation rather than information. So as a more than, the More Than a Member Challenge week one was for you to consider more than a member means not just knowing answers to tricky theological questions. Knowing the right information isn't changing anybody's life. And so we're challenging you to think formation, not information. Changing lives, starting with people rather than religious activities and what you know. Uh, That was two weeks ago. Last week, Sam challenged you to think and consider yourself as an important part of the body of Christ here in this place. You are an important part of the body of Christ, the people of God, here in this church family, and who you are matters to the ministry of this place. And when any part of the body is not present, when any part of the body is detached or says, well, I'm not important or I'm not as good as this person or whatever, then the body of Christ suffers. Then we are not at our best when we're absent. We're not at our best when the body of Christ doesn't stand together. So the more than a member challenge last week was you are an important part of the body of Christ. Uh, And with you here, with your gifts and your skills, we are more uh, impactful uh, as the people of God here in this place. Uh, Today, I want to talk about this. Today, ideally, the church, that is the people, in case we forgot, 
Ideally, the church family functions best or functions as a unified team within the kingdom of God. Ideally, the church family functions as a unified team within the kingdom of God. Uh, I was talking with uh, some of the children at the end of uh, last service, and Willow Lewis and I were having a conversation, and I just asked her, Willow, when you think of team, what do you think of? She said, well, I'm on a softball team. Okay, so for Willow, for many of our kids, for some of you that think teams, you think a sports team, right? For Willow, it's her softball team. And I asked Willow, I said, Willow, what happens on your softball team when one person on the team decides they're going to do their own thing? When they decide they're going to pull in a different direction than the rest of the team, she's like, well, we'd never win if that happened. Out of the mouths of children, right? Yeah, and it's never going to happen. A victory is never going to happen. We're never going to be at our best if one member on the team is pulling in a different direction. That's true in sports teams. Uh, it's true in teams on a project. If you've ever worked with a group of people on a project before, uh, unity is a beautiful thing. Sometimes it's called chemistry. Sometimes it's that, it's that thing you can't quite put your hand on or your finger on, but there's unity there, there's chemistry there, the, the team is moving in the same direction, and you've experienced the opposite too. When someone's pulling in a different direction, there's not unity and you're not at your best as a team. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 13 today, Paul's talking about the church family. Uh, I had two folks this morning before the early service ask, is there a wedding in church today? Because 1 Corinthians 13 is usually the text that's read at a wedding, and it's actually not a reading that should be in that context. As you read through 1 Corinthians 13, Paul is not talking about marriages, although it would be great if marriages like, did the things that Paul's talking about there. He's actually talking about the church. He's actually talking about the body of Christ. And if you were here last week, Sam used 1 Corinthians 12 the chapter right before, all 31 verses, good decision, uh, all 31 verses to talk about the body of Christ, right, what it means that we all function together as family, and it's one of the great cliffhangers in all of the Scriptures. In verse 31 of chapter 12, Paul says, after he's talked about the body of Christ, he says, and now I will show you the most excellent way, and then it's, the chapter's over. You're like, well, what is the most excellent way? What is the most excellent way to maintain unity within the body of Christ? 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul says, well, it's love, and love is patient, love is kind, love doesn't boast, it keeps no record of wrongs. He goes through his list, and he says, and these three, these three things remain for unity within the body of Christ, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Paul's not talking about a marriage in chapter 13, he's talking about church family. He's talking about what it means to be the body of Christ uh, here in this place. And uh, so ideally, the church, the people of God, we function as a unified team within uh, our church family. This is true. And so what Paul does in 1 Corinthians 13, he talks about the negative side of unity and the positive side of unity uh, within a team. And so if you're here this morning, and we're going to challenge you with the more than a member challenge, I am at the end of the message today, but if you're here this morning and you're not even a religious person, here's the good news for you. This works in your, in your marriage. This works in your family. This works in the office. This works uh, in the community, in your sports team. This isn't religious. This is real. This is how relationships work. And so uh, the negative side of unity in a team, in a, in a team situation, sports team, project team, church family, uh, your family, uh, this is true. And Paul is getting at this uh, in 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, he's, as he's talking about team and unity specifically within the church, he says, well, this is what will destroy unity in the church quickly. He says, envy, it doesn't envy. It doesn't boast, it's not proud, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love, it doesn't delight in evil when someone else, is, when someone else fails, we ought not delight in that because that will destroy unity. And so Paul is giving us a picture of what disunity can look like, and it, it happen very quickly, uh, disunity can. And so gossip and negative talk, it destroys unity quickly, doesn't it? 
super, like almost instant. It doesn't matter how much time you've put in to gain some unity in chemistry. Gossip and negative talk can destroy teams, can destroy relationships very quickly. I love what James says. Uh, And James, if you've ever read uh, his letter, he's pretty direct and pretty harsh. He talks about our tongues, talks about our words this way. He says, the tongue is also a what? Be careful with that. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. And I highlighted this because he's talking, James is, not only about you as an individual, he's also talking about the body of Christ. He's talking about the church family. And with our words, as we speak them, with our words, there's great potential to light the body on fire. There's great potential to do damage uh, within the body of Christ. Uh, James says it that way. Uh, King Solomon, uh, 3,000 years ago, if you give me the next slide, uh, says it this way in Proverbs. Uh, Solomon says, those who guard their mouths and their tongues keep themselves from calamity. Uh, That's in uh, the NIV. I actually prefer the King James translation of this better. It's actually a better translation from the Hebrew uh, because the King James translation says, Those who guard their mouths and their tongues keep their souls from great troubles. Keep what's inside of here from great trouble. Guarding our tongues, guarding our speech, guarding the words that come out of our mouth, actually keep what's inside of you from great troubles. I was at a, Sam's going to pray for this uh, later on, but I was at our Eastern District Convention uh, this past uh, week uh, for a couple of days. And uh, we had one of the vice presidents of our church body, uh, the, our national church body, uh, speak to us. And he was talking about unity. And he said, one of the great problems amongst clergy today is this, uh, for a number of reasons. But one of the great problems in the clergy right now, us pastor uh, folks, is that there is a lot of this going on digitally amongst the brothers Uh, There is a great disunity amongst the clergy uh, in our denomination because of the evil, slanderous talk that is going on behind cell phones, behind the computer screen, that when there's an issue from one brother to the next, this happens, like a a, a hurtful word is spoken, and once you hit post or push send, uh, there's great division that comes out of that. And so he had some harsh words for us pastors to say, hey, The words of Jesus actually still work. When you have an issue with a brother, don't push post or send. Pick up the phone and call. Well, I guess we use this for that too. These are just these are computers that make really crappy phone calls. In all honesty, now pick up the phone and to call the brother and set up a time to sit and face to face have a conversation. Right, Matthew eighteen. Go to your brother in love. That's a little harder sometimes. But for the sake of unity within the clergy, uh, he was challenging us that we ought to do that. My guess is us clergy aren't the only ones with that issue. My guess is those of us uh, who who serve as pastors aren't the only ones who have that problem. You know that about us already, that we have issues. Uh, But that's probably true for us. I would actually pass that word on to you. Is it kind of sad in my gut this weekend that before you hit post, before you hit send, maybe sleep on it? And maybe have the courage to sit down with somebody one-on-one and have a face-to-face conversation. Uh, that's That's a good word. Because what's true is gossip and negative talk destroys unity quickly in the home, in your workplace, uh, on sports teams. uh, It's just true. And so that's kind of the negative side of what Paul is talking about with with disunity, specifically in the church, in the body of Christ. But then he goes on to talk about how it works. And so how unity works and how we are at our best pulling in the same direction as the people of God is this. Paul says, sacrificial love and forgiveness are the great intentional actions for stronger unity within a team or family. Specifically, he's talking about the local church. Specifically, he's talking about us together as church family. That sacrificial love and forgiveness are the great intentional actions for stronger unity within a team or family. And if you've been on a sports team or you've been on a a project team before, you know unity doesn't just happen. Chemistry doesn't just happen. It's intentional actions on the people that are in the team that actually uh, make unity and chemistry come about. And Paul says it this way. He says, and he says this in Ephesians 4, 
be completely what? Humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. And I love this, make every effort. And I highlighted that uh, because Paul's point is this is difficult. It's not easy. Make every effort means, like, try really hard uh, to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. In 1 Corinthians 13, often the wedding text, but hear these words in the context of our church family. Hear these words as Paul has written them within the context of the body of Christ. For the sake of unity in the church, Paul says, love is patient, love is kind, Uh, Love doesn't delight in evil. It actually rejoices with the truth even when it's hard because the truth is rarely easy, right? Rejoice with the truth. Uh, It always protects, always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres because perseverance is difficult. Going the long haul is difficult. Uh, Love always perseveres. And then he says, love never fails. And then at the end, in verse 13, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. And so sacrificial love and forgiveness, they are the great uh, intentional actions for stronger unity within a team or a family. And so the more than a member challenge that I'm, I'm, I'm challenging you with, and some of you, just please take this, and some of you are already doing this, is uh, intentional unifiers within the body of Christ here. And some of you, you're hearing this and going, yeah, that's me. God's in my gut right now, and I'm, I'm, I'm asking you for this. More than a member challenge, will you be a unifying force within our church family? Will you be a unifying force uh, within our church family? And what does that look like? It's Paul in 1 Corinthians 13. It's Paul in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, patience and humility and kindness and love for one another. Uh, and so today, will you be a unifying force in our church family? And here's something beautiful, at least in my mind. When we take the Lord's Supper today, another word for the Lord's Supper is Holy Communion. And the ancient church fathers, as they gave a name to this moment in worship, one of the names they gave to it was Holy Communion. What do you hear in that word, communion? Community is kind of the concept. Uh, So Holy Communion has at its root a holy set-aside time for the community because it's there that the Spirit of God is doing this. Even though we don't feel it sometimes, God is, through the Lord's Supper, uniting us together by the power of the Holy Spirit through bonds of peace and love, and He's doing that work for us even without us realizing it. And so as you uh, come forward and receive the Lord's Supper today to be reminded that God is doing that work in us already, the question is, will you be a unifying force uh, in our church family uh, today and in the days ahead? I want to pray for that. Uh, right now, uh, and to pray for uh, you as you come forward to receive the Lord and the Lord's Supper, to be more mindful of that. Then a holy communion, God is knitting us together more and more together as his people on mission in this community. Let's pray. Lord God, as we journey through these weeks and talk about what it means to be more than a member, more than just having a name on a page, uh, more than being on the rolls, more than institutional church stuff, more than religious activities, that there is a movement of God that has happened throughout all human history to redeem and restore and to change lives, and you've asked us to step into it. And for many of us, the conversations we have outside of here and sometimes even inside of here when we talk church, it goes the way of institution and religion and membership and activities, and we can't find that in the Bible anywhere. The scriptures teach something else of a movement of people changing and redeeming and restoring the lives of others. And so, God, as we're we're challenging the church over these weeks to think formation, not information, to think each and every one of us uh, is an important and critical part of the body, and we are at our best when we are together. And then this morning, being unifying forces within the family, unifying forces uh, in humility and kindness and gentleness and love 
because it's then that we're at our best and have the greatest impact uh, in the community. And so, God, this morning, for those that are hearing these words, the words of St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 that is often used as a wedding text, uh, God, he's, he's writing for unity in the church that we'd have on our hearts more than a member to be a unifying force with faith, hope, and love, but love being the great gift, uh, the great unifying force within the church, that we might more and more have greater impact on the lives of others, both within and uh, outside uh, the ministry of the church. God, we ask for that, and we ask for it in the name of Jesus. Amen.